In this comparative study, I will explore the similarities and differences between Venantius Fortunatus' personal poem 8.6 and the Adagietto of Gustav Mahler's Fifth Symphony. By comparing and contrasting the poetic and musical imageries, I will show that both the poem and the music have strong appeal to the olfactory senses despite their lack of direct description on smell or fragrance. By overwhelming the audience's sense of smell, the personal poem 8.6 in the Adagietto create elevated heavenly spaces and later reject the plausibility of such artistic imagination, which leads to the work's somber and ambiguous endings. To start my analysis, I should reconcile the humongous historical and personal gap between the late antiquity poet and the 20th century composer. By contextualizing their works, and showing the sensory landscape of their eras. Written to Radigand, Fortunatus' intimate female friend and an illustrious religious figure in the late antiquity, the personal poem 8.6 was created in an age when the human bodily experience was already embraced and cherished in religious worship. According to Susan Harvey, different from the early years of late antiquity when physicality was seen as pagan and were shunned by the Christian community, the 4th century witnessed a changed attitude towards the role of sensation and sensory experience in religious practice and a resurgence of interest in the martyr stories. The martyrdom of Bishop Polycarp in year 155, recorded in an epistolary work by the local Christian community, testifies the strength of sensory impressions in late antiquity literary tradition. According to the latter, the martyr, being put on the execution pyre, was not engulfed by the fire. Instead, the flames surrounded him like a furnace. The witnesses further describe the bishop's body as a bread being baked, and they claim the air was filled with fragrance that smelled like incense or expensive perfume. Through several sensory imageries, the followers of Polycarp turned a traumatic event into a spiritual purgation, and the obvious correlation between divinity and fragrance in their narrative was exhibited in later works, such as Prudentius Hymns, and consequently being inherited by Fortunatus' poetic outputs. Similar to the personal nature of poem 8.6, the Adagietto, which is the fourth movement of Mahler's Fifth Symphony, was a love letter that the composer dedicated to his fiancée, Elma, and it reflected the profound philosophical mind that Mahler has. Born in the late 19th century, Mahler lived in an age when faith and philosophy was a central part of intellectual discourse. Described by his childhood friend as a God-seeker, Mahler was particularly interested in the concept of God in Nietzsche and Gustav Fechter's thinkings, and he incorporated his contemplation on the world and nature into his musical works, such as his Third Symphony, where the composer does not shy away from using beautiful melodic lines to elicit imageries of unspoiled forests and summer grassland filled with flowers under both Christian and classical contexts. In the beginning of poem 8.6, Fortunatus apologizes for not sending roses and lilies, but only violets. By listing these three particular flowers, the poet sets his poetic space in early spring and brings his readers to the time of Easter. While the flowers themselves are describing great visual details such as lilies glittered white and roses dazzled brilliantly red, in line 3, the poet relates these flowers with distinctive fragrance to a larger space. By mentioning that he plucked the flowers from a field or garden as a gift, Fortunatus expanded his aromatic landscape to nature or an enclosed pristine place similar to the Garden of Eden. In terms of gifting, in Stephen de Evelyn's analysis, the poem may have sent the violence along with the poem in return for something sent by Radigand. The season of revival combined with the divine connotation of fragrance and the religiosity of the recipient of the gift complicate the Fortunatus narrative. In his poem, the floral fragrance not only build an intimate friendship between him and Radigand, but also elevate his gift, 
which include both a flower and his poem, from an earthly exchange to a heavenly blessing. While smell is evoked through imageries of flowers in Fortunata's poem, Mahler elicits the olfactory senses through breathing. Known to be a composer capable of creating sensory experience in emotional music lines, Mahler exhibits his talent in the first few verses of the Adagietto. Beginning with a solo harp passage followed by a string orchestra, the Adagietto is a song without words. Revealed by a letter that Elma sent to her conductor friend, Willem Mengelberg, the piece was sent to her accompanied with a poem that can be served as the lyrics to the main melodies, which makes the context of music comparable to that of Fortunata's poem. By writing breathing marks in the verses and no noting the subtle changes of volume, the composer creates a suspenseful melody that invites the audience to sing along with and subsequently breathe with. The prolonged musical phrases with a very transient pausing also contribute to the suspension, causing the audience to breathe with caution as if a careless inhaling will break the verses. It is exactly through the sense of uncertainty when breathing that Mahler conveys a sense of longing and irresolution and places his affection to his fiance in a serious place where everything seems to be floating in stagnation. While the appealing to the olfactory senses allow Fortunatus and Mahler to convey their affection in elevated spaces, there are certain moments in poem 8.6 and the Adagietto that makes the audience question the validity of the artistic imagination that the poet and the composer create. In line 5 to 6, Fortunatus confesses the incredibility of his narrative. Trying to find roses and lilies, the poet only managed to find violets in the springtime garden. Instead of accepting the inadequacy of the reality, Fortunatus claims that his love and affection for Radigan transformed the violets into roses. By intentionally confusing the two flowers with its distinctive floral scents and meanings, Fortunatus morphed the boundary between the reality and his poetic imagination, and consequently destabilizes his poetic space. Similarly, Mahler also chooses to evade the deficiency of his reality. After the first melodic section, the adagietto presents a short passage filled with tension. The sudden change of mood makes the passage an oddity that stands out from the rest of the adagietto. Nevertheless, it is a callback to the other movements of symphonies which betrays the tumultuous emotional life the modern experience in the reality.
However, Mahler did not choose to elaborate on this section of crisis. After three musical sentences, the composer quickly transformed the section into a passage that is characterized by floating melodies. With a sudden decrease of volume, the new passage forces the audience to hold their breathing. In the first few verses of the section, the melody slowly extends as a flower stretching out its petals, while the audience are forbidden to smell it inquisitively. By ignoring the tension from the reality and suppressing the audience's olfactory senses, Mahler indulges the audience in an elevated place and invades the listener's challenge to the credibility of his narrative. Besides breathing, the musical space of Mahler's adagietto is further destabilized by the composer's quotation of Wagner's opera Tristan and Isolde in this soft section. As Wagner's most famous love opera, Tristan and Isolde tells the medieval legend about the forbidden love between an Irish princess and an English knight. By frequently bringing up the love grants motif from the opera, Mahler may intend to show the passion that he has for Elma, without realizing the tragic connotation that the melody conveys and the threat it poses to his serene musical landscape. While smell allows the artist to build heavenly spaces and evade the audience inquisitions, the instability of Fortunatus and Mahler's narrative inevitably allude to the destruction of their artistic imagination. The personal point 8.6 is nevertheless a futile attempt that Fortunatus makes to bring Radigan into his aromatic world. While the outcome of the dipting is not addressed, in poem 8.6. In personal poem 8.8, Fortunatus records his failure in persuading the religious woman to abandon her ascetic lifestyle and embrace nature as a living paradise that she can draw inspiration from. In line 15 to 18, the poet pleads to his friend, a highly spiritual figure who shuns all earthly influences, to put the flowers in her hairs because he wishes to see her again in the world while the glory of paradise awaits her. This poignant moment with the anticipated disappointment in 8.8 .8, irrevocably calls back to the last verse of poem 8.6. Using an optative subjunctive, the poet betrays his realization that his friend will not look at the aromatic space that he creates. Because no matter how he tries to persuade her about the ethereal nature of flowers, in Radigan's mind, the flowers are worldly and temporal creations, incompatible to her determination and unwavering spirituality. Contrasting to every other line in 8.6, where specific flowers and natural landscapes are mentioned, in line 12, the poet does not provide concrete imageries that can invoke olfactory senses. In the end of poem 8.6, with the vanishing of Fortunata's aromatic world, the readers received an ending in empty words. Comparing to Fortunata's vacant ending, Mahler's music space is destructed on a more uncertain and heart-wrenching note. In the last section of the adagietto, the composer repeats the main section melody with a new arrangement of instruments. 
through a series of descending chords, the piece receives its long-awaiting climax. Waving his baton as a golden arrow that the angels wield against Saint Teresa in Bernini's statue, the legendary conductor Leonardo Bernstein showcases the most epic moment of his interpretation of modern symphony along with the Vienna Philharmonic. The chords strike like a lightning, catches the audience by surprise. At that moment, you cannot breathe but take in the sheer power and strength of the chords. With the suppression of audience breathing, the musical space of Adagietto falls from the sky and shatters in our hands. The reaction to the music's ending is always a contentious debate among the musicologists. However, as someone who has both played the piece and enjoyed it in the audience seats, I never received the ending of Mahler's Adagietto with aesthetic joy. To me, it is an ending that evokes a shattering sense of loss, and to say the least, disappointment. By suppressing the audience's olfactory senses and overwhelm it subsequently, Mahler leaves an ending similar to that of Fortunatus' poem. The last sentence of the Adagietto, just like the last verse of the personal poem 8.6, fades like the burnt incense, leaving a trace of the fragrance in the air while the substance of the music is gone completely. Through olfactory senses, Fortunata's personal poem 8.6 and Mahler's Adagietto are united despite the great historical gap between them. By appealing to the readers and audience smell, the poet and the composer express their adoration to their most intimate female friends. In the end, Fortunatus and Mahler face the inevitable destruction of their narrative, leaving the fragile sensory world built by words and music demolished by the reality and possibly their insufferable passion and devotion.